Johanna Rickne, Professor of Economics at the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University. Welcome. Thank you. On the subject of women's underrepresentation in top jobs uh, of organizational hierarchies, at first, how did you come up with, with doing a study about this? Yeah, so th first of all, I'm super happy to be here today. Um, this is a very inspiring uh, uh, conversation. Um, so I was actually researching another issue that came up in the discussion right now, which was uh, gender quotas. And uh, we were researching how gender quotas impact on the competence of organizations and how, whether or not it undercuts women's long-term chances at careers. So we were looking at quotas and careers, and then we were looking at uh, various descriptive statistics of women leaders of organizations, and it turned out that women leaders, the top positions, women like across Across sectors, there was a, a twice the size of the divorce rate for women leaders compared to men leaders. So we started wondering, you know, okay, does this mean that women go for top positions after their divorce, or is it the promotion itself that causes more stress for women's uh -huh. relationships? And that's what you're going to talk about now. So that's what we try but to but look first, at. But before heading into that, very interesting topic, <laughs> what did you find when it came to quotas? Yeah, so uh, for quotas, we were studying uh, uh, political parties, Varandan Damanas, it was a quota in Swedish Social Democratic Party. And uh, in Sweden, we have really good data on uh, competence. So for example, intelligence tests and leadership skills from the military draft. So we could look at the competence of men in these parties, 290 parties over time, exactly who was elected in, in all these municipalities before the quota and then after the gender quota came into place. And uh, what the result was that the women's branch, when they described the quota as the crisis of the mediocre men, this turned out to be uh, true because who left with the quota were men who were more mediocre than others. So the quota seemed to weed out some of the mediocre men rather than bring in less competent women. Okay, so they were there on the merit of being a man, not so much the merit of being intelligent or skilled or whatever? Um, or what not was your everywhere, conclusion? of course, but I think when we study quotas, we have to be mindful of whether or not meritocracy exists before the quota is put into place. If okay. there's not a lot, like if there are limitations to the meritocracy before the quota, then it might be the case that the quota itself strengthens rather than weakens meritocracy. Okay, interesting. And now let's hear about your latest research, which is found to be published uh, public in January, something like that. So, Yeah, if anybody wants to read it, it's uh, at my web page. The stage is yours, Johanna. Finns det en klickare? Ah, here. Okay. Mm. Ah, okay. Okay, so the, um, what I'm about to present is a specific research study called uh, All the Single Ladies, Job Promotions and the Durability of Marriage, co-authored with Ole Folke. So the background here um, is from an economics perspective, trying to understand the forces that lead to such a small percentage of women in top jobs. So this is some, sometimes framed in economics as a uh, puzzle because, um, there is such persistence in the lack of women on top jobs, despite the economic convergence of some of the macro level factors that we'd expect, you know, already uh, to have produced more women. For example, oop, is this automatic? Ah, uh, I? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so labor force participation between men and women evened out in the 1970s. Rates of tertiary education between men and women was also like m women have exceeded men's rates of higher education since the 70s. If you ask men and women what careers they want, that is also very uh, equal by now and has been so for decades. So why, despite these factors, is there such slow sh change at the top? So uh, just taking some select references from uh, the economics literature. The roots of uh, lack of women in top jobs can be divided into some demand factors, people that make recruitment and then supply factors. These would be the women and men themselves. So on the demand side, we can have different types of discrimination, statistical discrimination, taste-based discrimination, some attention discrimination or others. Um, 
it can be harder for women to, yeah, this changes automatically, so I don't know if, okay. uh, it might be harder for women to signal their competence uh, to, rec to the people that make the recruiter recruitments. Um, if those people are mostly men rather than women, this has to do with like how people communicate competence to people of the same gender versus not. Uh, something that was already discussed is uh, stereotypes that can be associated and often are with women and men. So we have stereotypes about how women and men's personalities are, and those might not al always coincide with our stereotypes about what's needed for specific top jobs. Uh, there can be stereotypes that a leader has to be risk-taking or has to be competitive, and then there exists gender stereotypes where women are not as risk-taking and competitive as men. So clearly then women aren't fitting, like perceptions of women's personality are not fitting with perceptions of what needs to go into this role, and when women try to do those things anyways, uh, we know from various lab experiments and others that they're not perceived as equally likable. So a woman who's trying to be competitive is like, yes, she seems smart, but I don't like her. So so that's the double bind of, uh, that's been shown in many of these types of studies. Uh, on the supply side, also we heard um, already women tend to make a, more, a larger number of career interruptions. They tend to be away from work for a longer time, especially when they become parents. So if women are away more, that reduces uh, employers' incentive to train women for top jobs. Another... Um, um, Another result in this literature is flexibility in job switching. That has, this has to do with the tendency for families not to move to another city. When women get a job offer, the family is more likely to move between cities for, to follow the career of the man rather than to follow the career of the woman. And finally, uh, there are some lab experiments showing that in the computer lab, yes, women seem to be less likely to enter into competitions and less likely to take risk. But people have tried to show whether or not these differences that you can see in a computer lab actually explains anything in terms of the difference in the actual labor market. And there, the evidence is very weak. Um, so what did we do in this paper? We tried to do look at an additional type of supply side constraint on women, women's career to top jobs. And this uh, supply side constraint is women's relationships. Who are women and men married to? So the key question is, uh, does promotion to a top job affect marriage duration? And we find that, yes, women who get promoted to the top become dramatically more likely to divorce, uh, but we don't see that for men. Okay, why could this be happening? We think that this has to do with the fact that while the labor market has become much more progressive over time, like women are working, women are, have career ambitions. If you look at patterns in who marries who in society, that has not changed so much. You might think that by now, like couples would be pretty gender equal and some women would be married to men who want to stay more at home and take care of the children. And like some women would be married to older, like older men, some other women to younger men. So that like men and women would actually have very different, like very similar pattern of family formation. But that's not the case. Rather, if you look at who marries who, that's very similar now than what it was 30 years ago. So um, let me not go into a lot of details in how we did the study, but I still think it's, it's nice to, to talk a little bit about. So Sweden is great uh, in terms of doing research on these issues because we have this perfect database on everybody in the economy based on our mandatory ID codes. We know exactly in the whole economy who is married to who from the marriage register. We know which year everybody gets divorced. We know how many children they have, etc. Sorry. And in this paper, we look at two political jobs and one private sector job. For CEOs, we know uh, who became a CEO for 10, uh, over a period of 10 years. But the main um, positions that we can look at is mayor and parliamentarians. So I'm going to show you results for both of these. 
Um, why is it so good to look at mayors and, par and parliamentarians? Uh, it's because for these sectors, we can find all the, like, the candidates who wanted to be promoted to the top. And who are these candidates? Um, for parliament, people appear on the electoral ballot. And say that a party wins three seats on the ballot, so on Sweden's uh, rank ordered um, proportional representation lists, every candidate has a rank order, and you start counting the seats from the top. So if the party wins three positions, so say that all of us are on the list, then you count from the top and say, like, you three get elected, and maybe I was on the fourth position, I wanted to get into parliament, but I didn't, my party didn't get enough seats. So for all these lists, we can pick out these marginal candidates, the last person that got into parliament, and then the first loser who wanted to be promoted. They were a candidate for the job, but they didn't get promoted. So for these um, five elections, we take out all these marginal uh, parliamentarian candidates. And for the municipalities, for mayors, we do something similar. So in um, Swedish municipalities, there's a left block of parties competing usually against the right block of parties. So the party leader of the Social Democrats is, wants to be the mayor, and so does the party leader of the Conservatives, the biggest party in the right wing block. And in each municipality, we know who these candidates for mayor are because they are the top ranked person on the ballot of those parties. Okay, so we can uh, go to all the 290 municipalities in all these elections and we can find these two candidates to become mayor. So we pool the parliamentary candidates, the mayoral candidates, and we go back four years in time before the election that assigned this promotion. And then we throw out everybody who's not married. So at that point, 70% of the men and 61% of the women are married. And then we simply compare the probability to remain married among all those people each year before the election happens and then eight years after the election. So uh, this is what the results look like for the uh, uh, polit politicians. Mm, on the x-axis, we simply see the count of number of years from the election, starting four years before the election. On the y-axis, we can see that we start with 100% married. So this is by definition, because we threw out everyone who was not married. So we start at one, and then we see each year um, a percentage of people get divorced. So you see a decline in the percentage of people who remain married each year. But once we hit the, um, the vertical line that shows the election, where the, pr where the promotion was assigned to the women that make up the black line, we see that this black line starts declining faster. So women who get promoted to either parliament or to mayor start divorcing about twice as fast as the women who wanted to get into parliament or mayor, but did not. And those are, of course, the green line. So this, we think, is very striking evidence that the promotion itself is causing more stress, stress on women's relationships and uh, that it's a pretty big effect. Of course, the divorce is just, a, you could think of that as the final event of stress in the relationship. So you can imagine there existing a lot of stress, uh, even for the people that do not get divorced here. So uh, for men, of course, you see the lines perfectly overlapping. There's no effect that we can see of the promotion on the relationship stability of the men. Sorry, is it okay to ask a question? Yes. Hi, my name is Ilva Beckström. I, I was wondering whether you know about the causality. Do you know where there is a promotional stress that causes a divorce or where there is an unsupportive husband who doesn't support the promotion? That he didn't want her to be promoted. Yeah. Um, Is that part we, of the we research? Don't know, no, uh, but we can. Let me. G uh, or another reason, indeed. Mm, I think the results kind of sp speak to. I mean, I think it might be an unsupportive. Yes, it might be both. Like the husband being unsupported, there is some evidence for that, I think. Um, 
So uh, the figure down here, and I'm going to show uh, two more sets of figures that look like this. I just want to explain what it is. Um, these points here is simply a statistical, like an estimate, comparing the proportions of divorced women. So the black dots are comparing the proportion of divorced women in the promoted group compared to the non-promoted group each year compared to year zero, the year of the election. So this, these dots simply show the difference between those two trend lines. So before the promotion, there's no, there's a zero difference between the trend lines. And then after the promotion, we start seeing a negative estimate. So the promoted women are divorced, like they're less likely to remain in the relationship compared to the promoted men. So this is what we can then do is to divide this sample uh, by people who are in more or less gender equal relationships to reproduce this graph to see if there's a bigger divorce effect in women men with specific types of relationships compared to women in other types of relationships. Can I ask a question here? Yes. Uh, is this necessarily bad? <laughs> I mean, yes. isn't, is, isn't perhaps uh, the women that are divorcing better off divorcing than staying? Good point. <laughs> so something that we, you know, these, wi these women that we look at here, at the time of the promotion, the average age is 50, and the average length of their marriages is 20 years. Uh, we also know that when you ask people in society what they value in their life and what kind of life would they like to see for themselves long term, mo many people say that, oh, I would, love to, I would like to have a supportive, loving marriage, and I would like to have a career. Okay? So, of course, no happy marriages end in divorce. Right? So most of the time for people to get a divorce, they are unhappy for a while, but then they are, end up being happy to be out of the relationship. But would this be the first best situation for these women if you would have asked them you know, when they were young? You know, is this what society wants, that the women who get promoted to, to the top need to sacrifice their relationships to be happy, that, they're happier, that they are in relationships where they're happier without it? I, mean, no, I think I, that's what I, the kind of way we need to look at that question. Uh, yeah, so, so perhaps there are a couple of uh, follow-on qu questions to that to, uh, that you probably have already looked at. But uh, 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 promotion typically inclu uh, includes a better uh, income, and, and that means that there is an incentive to, to basically uh, uh, be more uh, independent if, if that has been a, 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 like a hindering factor before. Uh, that is not the same with men if there is a uh, income gap. Uh, that's certainly not before uh, uh, applying the same way. So, so have you made any uh, analysis whether there is a happiness score that's going up or down on this? No, but we did look at the economic independence as like the mechanism of that, and we didn't find any support for it in this data. I think here we need to keep in mind that these women that get into these top jobs, the vast majority of them were already in the top five percentiles of the earnings distribution. These are not necessarily women that win economic independence by their promotion. Rather, they're women, like when we look at top jobs, these are women that already had economic independence by means of their own wage, but then they get, yes, they get an additional pay, but it's not what we traditionally think of as that winning economic independence per se. And also, we don't see that the women who get a bigger wage increase when we compare the pre- and post-promotion wage, there's no correlation between the size of the pay increase and the probability to divorce here for women. Yes. And the wives. Yes, we did. So we tried to see if the partner adapted their income to the promotion, and we didn't see any of that. And that's actually a, a pretty standard result in economics literature. If you look at tax cuts or something else, tax hikes, like the partner very rarely adapts their own labor supply to the part, something that happens to the partner. And here we didn't see that, like the wives of these m promoted men, they work much less than the husbands of the promoted women. Okay, that's an important difference, I think, but we didn't see that the husbands of the promoted women had any changes in their um, hours of work or wages after. Just a question. 
Do you know how many of them who actually got uh, remarried or yes. found a new partner and Who's maybe <laughs> increased their happiness <laughs> afterwards? Oh, there. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm going to show that. Yes, I will show that. Um, so here, um, you might expect, this goes back to the question before too, that women who get promoted or not have very different relationships. Maybe some of them that get promoted, you're like, you can look for the promotion if, you're, if your partner is not supportive of you. You try to, like, women select into the promotion. So what we do here, what is so nice in politics, is we can look at close elections. This is when one block or one, like, a parliamentary candidate wins with a very small vote margin. This means that like a couple of voters went to the poll or like some voters didn't have a broken leg. So there is almost a toss up, like a randomization of the promotion when the election is so close. So even when we look at these close elections where it's nearly impossible to know who is going to get the job, we see this divorce effect on the women, but not the men. So this strongly indicates that it's not some selection of different types of women compared to men into the promotion. Um, here is the graph for CEOs. Um, so for CEOs, we unfortunately don't have information on the women who wanted to be CEO but didn't become CEO. We can only compare men and women who became CEOs at some point in time. But at least we can look before and after promotion for those promoted people. So these, uh, this sample here is internal promotions, uh, so promotions from being not the CEO of a company, but working in that company, to then becoming CEO of that company in year one. Um, and we only chose companies with more than 100 employees um, to, like, to try to get at these top jobs. So starting four years uh, before the promotion, both these men and women are married, and then you see, again, some people divorcing, but the women that get promoted to CEO, they do uh, start divorcing faster than the men who get promoted to CEOs. Um, and in fact, in our data, we can look at many types of education programs. So we took people who graduated from medical school, from police academy, from like the priest academy, and some different educations in 1990. And then we tracked their relationships uh, 20 years in registered data. And something that we could see across these different education cohorts was that across co like these different education types was that within cohorts, the women who after 20 years was in the top half of the earners of their cohort, their graduating cohort, they had much higher probabilities of being divorced compared to the women that 20 years after graduate, graduation was not in the top half of earners. And for men, it was actually the opposite. For men, being in the top half of the earners of their own cohort was associated with a lower probability to divorce. Okay, so arguably, I mean, we have, I've presented this a lot in acad academia, and there is a lot of anecdotal evidence from universities when it comes to women's promotions. So, um, I want to quickly talk about uh, the mechanisms, which I already alluded to. Here, we submitted this paper to an academic journal, and we were, on our first attempt, uh, rejected because the editor claimed that we had totally forgotten about the main mechanism, why women would get divorced after getting to, to the top, uh, which uh, that person thought was uh, the so-called temptation effect. So suppose that women that get promoted to the top are tempted by all these new men that are around. <laughs> but for men who get promoted, <laughs> yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a nice reaction. There's always a different reaction. If it's like a room with mostly men, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we had to take a very careful look at whether or not women were getting tempted by their prom when they got promoted. So we found a very, very little support for this. Uh, first, we could compare women who were promoted, and since these are political jobs, politics is usually a very gender equal um, work environment, or more so than the place where they were before. 
So coming into parliament, for example, from a male-dominated versus a woman-dominated uh, previous job, you'd expect if the temptation effect was true, that women who came into parliament from a very woman-dominated workplace, they would be more tempted because they're now in parliament with some more men around. And uh, the other way for women who entered from like a male-dominated sector, but there was absolutely no correlation between those things. Um, and I mean, an even better test is to look directly in the data for these women who are promoted and divorced, at what rate do they actually find new partners? Because we can see that in the data, right? We can see all the new marriages and with some measurement error, also the new cohabiting relationships that we, these women enter into. So um, the black bars here is the proportion of people that get uh, divorced in the first three years uh, following the election. This is just the main result. You know, we see more divorces among the promoted women than all the other groups. And the gray bars here is the proportion of people who um, uh, had uh, remarried someone after eight years from the election. So the proportion that remarry eight years after is similar in these. Uh, and when we compare the two, the ratio of remarriage for divorced people is 22% of the divorced and promoted women were remarried after eight years. But you see that the numbers are higher for these others. So for women who divorced when they were not promoted, they had a higher probability of remarriage compared to the women who divorced um, who were promoted. So if anything, it seems like being promoted makes it harder for women to find someone new on the marriage market. Uh, they are less successful in, f this is bad news, okay. <laughs> They're less successful than all the other groups in finding new marriages and also we show in an appendix in finding new cohabiting relationships. So it doesn't seem to be that they're tempted by new partners, because in that case, we would have seen more remarriages among the promoted and divorced women. Uh, what do we think is more important? We think, as I said in the beginning, that the types of marriages that men and women go into is, could be like that. That's a very important factor here because the labor market has become very progressive. We expect women to take half of all the top jobs, but we still don't expect like, men to do all the half of the unpaid work in the household. Uh, and I think even more important than the unpaid work, the status relationship in the family, norms around that has not changed very much. So women, still expect to find the prince in the fairy tale or marry up in the marriage market to get a good catch, you know, someone who is uh, successful and so on. And men don't have that pressure or they don't uh, have the norm of marrying up. Okay, so in previous research that has looked at the inequality within couples in Sweden over time has found that this actually moves very slowly. So couple formation today remains about equally traditional as it was 30 years ago. Women still marry someone who's older, has more higher income than them. Men tend to marry someone who's younger than them, has lower income, often lower education. Yes. Uh, I just wondering, like, do we, in this uh, whole study, uh, is Sambo considered? Um, because it's a like, sort of, a very uh, accepted form of like sharing like a partnership. So is Sambo anywhere considered in the study? Yes, so the problem with Swedish data is that we, don't, we have some measurement errors of those cohabitations. In the, what I just mentioned of the last slides, we do look at whether people form new cohabiting ships and we don't, also don't find that women are more successful in finding those. We have an appendix also for the main result where we add cohabiting ships and it looks very similar. But as you saw, like 70% of the men were married and 60% of the women in this sector uh, four years before the promotion. So we're still looking at quite a large proportion of these people. But uh, yeah, the reason it's not included in the main result is that there is measurement error. We only know if you're a Sambo, if you also have a home together or children. But if you're in an apartment, we don't know who you are. So it's kind of... Yeah, yeah. Panel coming up. I okay. just say to the audience that uh, keep a mental note of your questions and I'll get 
to them and ask you in a short while after we've had the panel session as well. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. So uh, I will just tell you how we measured uh, the Re like how gender equal relationships are. Here we wanted some factors that measured um, gender inequality at the time of the match, so when people met. So we chose the spousal age gap and the woman's share of total parental leave. And this is just the distribution of those variables in the sample of politicians. You can see on the top that women politicians tend to take the vast majority of parental leave and men take a very small share, most of them. And here you see the age gap between the politician and their spouse. So most of the women politicians are younger than their spouse and most of the men are older. So then what we do is simply just split the sample to see if there's more or less divorce uh, for women and men who have a larger or smaller age gap or a more or less gender equal division of parental leave. Mm, so, as I, as I said, this graph um, uh, measures, if you remember, the size, of the, like the size of the difference between the two trend lines in divorce, and the black dots are for women. So, negative estimates here, the black dots turning, like, dropping down after the promotion year means that promoted women are being divorced uh, faster than women who are not promoted. And the middle graph here is couples with an age gap less than four, four years. And this here is where the politician is four years or more younger than their spouse. So if we compare the black dots in the left graph to the middle graph, it's, uh, it was very striking to us that for women, and this is about half the sample, women in these less, like in the, with a smaller age gap, we don't see any divorce effect on those women. And in comparison, women who are younger than their partner by more than four years, we see like twice the divorce effect. So here, 15%, the size of the estimate is that three years into the promotion, there's a 15 percentage point gap in divorce opening up between the promoted and non-promoted who go into like the, that with this large age gap. And that is interestingly also the case for men who are younger than their spouse. Okay, this uh, just is my last graph, and this does the same thing for the split of parental leave. We have to be generous in defining more gender equal division, but even so, couples where the wife took uh, less than 90%, so the husband is taking more leave, we don't see any divorce effect of the promotion, but the divorce effect seems concentrated in this relationship where the woman took the most, like the vast majority of parental leave. So, um, yeah, just to conclude in this paper, we were interested in reasons why women are not making it into top jobs. Of course, uh, the Swedish state has long invested in the so-called dual earner model. We want, like as a country, Sweden's had the ambition to let both men and women have both the relationships and their careers. But even so, we find a dramatic impact on divorce from being promoted to a top job for women, but not for men. Okay, um, traditionally, we're, th like we're thinking about the supply impacts to top jobs as being about, for example, women's personalities or women, women becoming parents and treating that differently, differently. But here, we're interested in couple formation. Uh, who you choose to marry or get into a relationship with is very important for what's going to happen when that career develops into a top job. And for women, you know, women are still in Sweden today going into very, like both women and men, are in very gender unequal relationships. Women don't usually go into a relationship with a man who's happy to work part time, etc., to support her career. And men, meanwhile, have those supportive relationships. So what we argue is that as long as women, and you know, this is an important factor to consider um, when it comes to understanding why women aren't moving into top jobs as fast as we would expect. So, um, as a society, we should discuss more the norms of who marries who to understand women's long-term economic empowerment. And uh, interestingly, uh, as we discussed, you know, this might have good or bad consequences for the women themselves. They might be happier without the relationship or not. Society might want a structure where both men and women can have both these things. 
Um, but there's also recent research showing big demonstration effects for junior women. So in this paper, what they did was to ask uh, women, this is an American school, about their career ambition. So imagine here, like, I would ask everyone to write down a piece of paper, like, what, how much money do you want to make in the future? How much do you want to work in the future? How much do you want to travel? So then everybody's writing down their career ambition, but I randomize whether or not I tell you that I'm going to read your ambition and tell everybody else about your ambitions. So what they found in this uh, paper was a huge gap between single and married women in these MBA programs, that women who were single, when they thought that their ambitions were going to be told by the group, they severely understated their ambitions, like s giving a lower wage demand, being less willing to travel, etc. But for women who were married, there was no difference between the private treatment and the public treatment. So what does this mean? That for women, there is still today in the women in American MBAs programs, at least, knowledge about this sensitivity that if, like, when your career ambitions are going to be told to a room full of men that you can supposedly date and marry, women tend to understate their career ambitions because they are aware that being very ambitious is going to make them less likely to get, you know, give a positive impression on the potential partner. Okay, so this um, this is very interesting and uh, supports, <laughs> you know, our view that, you know, also when you go into a relationship not being clear about your career ambitions, then all of a sudden you're reaching the top. That is a much larger strain than if you go into it from the start, saying that you're both going to support each other rather than focusing on his career. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.